The stickers are in. They've got new stickers. You just open that packet. You don't know what's in there. And then you'll be like, got, got, need, need. When you see that sticker that you've been longing for, it's hard to keep a lid on it, really. Big bundles of stickers. If you got this one, if you got that one, I'll swap you this for that. Quick flick flow, look for the shinies, look for your team. Proper shiny. Gold. There's something magical about it. It's brilliant. Card collecting is now big business, and an Italian company, Panini, are the leaders in the field. They were selling millions of packets of stickers in the UK and worldwide. And that brought to the attention of the football mad tabloid newspapers. You had the Maxwell group and you had the Murdoch group. The two owners didn't get on. It didn't matter what you were looking at, they would compete. We loved the world that we were in at Panini. That world was going to be destroyed by just a major capitalist. So if we were going to carry on with what we liked doing, we had to form our own company to do it. And hand on heart, I said, look, OK, there are risks, but I don't feel that. I had no hesitation and no doubt that we could make it work. It's what happened when we got started that gave us sleepless nights. When I was young, I was an avid collector, like most of my classmates were at school. To complete one set, I needed George Best, who was probably the superstar at the time. And I had to go to the lengths of swapping a fully made Airfix model of the Graf Spade to acquire George Best. Getting that one missing card is like finding the Holy Grail. There's actually a name for people like me, Cartophilists. This is a British card produced around about 1880. First football card ever produced in the world. Moved through the next 60 years, which were dominated by cigarette cards. They had a demise following the Second World War as card and paper became quite scarce. We were resurrected in the late 50s and 60s uh, through the advent of bubblegum cards. Each card was almost like a work of art in itself, covering the universe of popular culture, if you like. My mother banned me from collecting uh, Mars attacks. They were quite shockingly violent in the past. Of course, those were the days when you weren't buying the cards, you were buying pink bubble gum, and the cards were free. Of course, the bubble gum was always pretty horrible. And pretty soon, the cards overtook the bubble gum. And then the sticker collector took over from the card collector. Peter, when you were a kid, did you collect football cards? No, I'm afraid I didn't. I wish I could say I did. <laughs> but I was more of a beer mat collector. It was the fun of racing into the pub and out again before anybody noticed me that uh, I think appealed to me. During the 70s, I was offered a job with W.H. Smith Distributors. They were the largest book distributor in Europe. And we had a lot of very nice clients. And one of those was Panini. It wasn't really until I took charge of that Panini account that I understood the enormity of it and the potential and frankly fell in love with it. The football sticker as we know it today was born in Modena, Italy. Giuseppe Panini and his three brothers ran an edicola, a news kiosk, off the town square. Everything ran around the, the, the kiosk, around the, the, the newspaper shops, and in that kiosk uh, was born the idea of the, of the envelope and the, and the cards. They had the idea to put these cards into an envelope so you don't know which kind of cards you can find in. They start to create an album, giving to the cards and stickers a life, uh, an identity. I think they surprised themselves with the popularity. They close the kiosk, they open a proper company, Panini Sport. Programma nostro di introduzione in tutta Europa. E non solo in Europa, ma anche oltre oceano abbiamo già degli approcci avanzati. Non, so, non, è, non è azzardato pensare che l'uno o l'altro si possa considerare Modena come la capitale mondiale delle figurine. They grabbed the chance, they grabbed the opportunity to make a World Cup collection that was better than the, than the competitors. <laughs> Beautiful goal, Tom. Sorry. Hell rain. Sorry. A 
When you touch the pages, something magical transpired. They understood the black arts of uh, sticker collecting. <laughs> It was enormous. I mean, it was sold all over the world and started a ball rolling, really, that has never stopped. In about 1976, I had a phone call from the chap who Panini had sent over to the UK. I said, well, would I be prepared to do the editorial work on their first British football collection? I thought that these stickers were just little tuppenny eightly packets and it didn't, they weren't terribly impressive. When I got to Modena and I saw the factory, I was so impressed with it, it's huge. They had what they call Fifi-matic machinery, which took the stickers and mixed them and packed them into the little envelopes. I switched to them as general manager of the UK company. Never looked back. <laughs> well, Kelvin came along as the marketing director. Getting that job with Panini was the single most magic business moment in my life, I'd say. Getting the chance to go to Italy, getting the chance to go to Italy on business, getting the chance to go to Italy and somebody else is paying for it, it was fantastic. They enjoyed to come to Italy, of course. <laughs> Who does enjoy to come to Italy? The Panini family that managed the business treated me and my staff as if we were part of their business and part of their family, which was even more important. Peter Warsop was asked to set up a new division for Panini specifically, and he interviewed me. At the end of the day, I thought, oh, I hope I'll get this job, because you know when you connect with somebody, it was just, just like that. And uh, fortunately, I did get the job. And in the UK office and, and the W.H. Smith distributors team were one. It was a wonderful partnership. I can remember watching England win the World Cup in 1966. Collecting football stickers became even more important. And if Panini were going to crack the UK market, they had a bit of a fight on their hands because FKS at the time were the market leaders. I can remember actually before Panini collecting FKS stickers and you got a little tube of glue and you had to glue them into the album. My team was Crystal Palace, so I, I just wanted to get the Palace players. And that was it. I, I wasn't really interested in Man United or Chelsea. <laughs> nah. The bad news is that you've got the stick the stickers into the album with glue. Glue in the hand of a 10-year-old child isn't the best idea in the world. I don't think you always realise at the time how bad some of these stickers are. Heads been pasted from a different picture onto somebody else's body. The artwork is dreadful. And worst of all, you see the kits having shamelessly been painted in. Then the revolution happened, and along came Panini. 78 was when it really came to life. You don't want collectors dribbling in. You need a lot starting altogether, and then you get that um, momentum. A common marketing method was to present the album and your first couple of packets of stickers free of charge with an appropriate publication. There were one or two football magazines out there, and the biggest one was Shoot. We all read Shoot magazine, the football magazine of the time. And I remember the January edition in 1978 where you know, we had this sticker album given away free, and it's like, oh, what's this? It was like the start gun go off. We had a sweet shop in Derby. My mum and dad would go to the cash and carry and then they'd come back and the stickers are in and all the kids would run, they've got new stickers. If you go outside a newsagent, you will see the torn open empty packets because the kids literally will just get out the door and tear open the packet before they go another 10 metres. And like, what have you got, what have you got? And it was like, got, 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 need, need, badly, badly. 
the game changer was you could peel them and stick them somewhere instantly. The whole feeling of peeling off those backing pieces just somehow added to the whole enjoyment of doing it. It was a sort of therapy, it made you feel really quite nice. I think when you first get the empty album, it's very bare. But then as you fill the book and you complete the first theme, it's really satisfying. Leash. Yes! Oh, the reactions of Peter Schultz. Beautiful stuff. And lo and behold, we have the first stickers that you could actually stick into the book. Oh, no glue, no licking, no mess. Just straight in the book. You've got the uniformity and the standardization of having the players in their kits, head and shoulders, looking very smart. We also had a team picture as well and also the shiny stick of the team badge. Just proper shiny. Gold. These were exceedingly good stickers. It felt deluxe. You're my magnificent obsession. It was inspirational, revolutionary, and uh, I'm afraid FKS lost out. 78 was a remarkable year. I arrived on the crest of a wave and <laughs> it was a very, very exciting time. We start a, a new story. We didn't know in that period, but the, the future was very interesting for, for all of us. Hi, have you started your Panini football album yet? We have! This year, six stickers for 10p. On sale now. Swap three red clemencies for a Paul Cooper. Sweet dreams are made of these. Who am I to disagree? The 1980s was Panini's golden age when the sticker craze really took over Britain's playgrounds. England qualify for the World Cup again. And uh, domestic sales of football collections were huge. It was colossal how it grew so quickly. We became Panini's biggest subsidiary outside Italy. It would be impossible to go to any school and not find a lot of collectors. I was the only girl that liked football in my school. My bedroom was full of football posters. And Glenn Hoddle, he was my idol. I was the only girl sticker collector. And so I used to just have to find any boy that had these stickers and swap with them. Hey, I'll swap with you and rush for your Nigel Clough. Go on then. Swapping was what it always was about from day one. And people would go to great lengths to acquire the cards that they needed. What are the rules of swapping at your school? Can you remember? Um, I think just the hardest lad got whatever he wanted. <laughs> We'd see kids just big bundles of stickers and elastic band and covered in plastic, making sure that they didn't get wet. Just saying, if you got this one, if you got that one, I'll swap you this for that. Might have a quick flip through, look for the shinies, look for your team. 
if a friend had a, a big pile like this of stickers, you know, you're not gonna go, 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 you know, it's like, keep going, I'll tell you when I want one. It was dog eat dog in the stickers world and uh, it was very, very competitive. You could command 10, 20 normal stickers for one badge or foil. With so many cards around, swapping has become a plague which is infecting schools. Some schools banned the stickers, which was brilliant for us, of course, because <laughs> they just would publish do you want. I'm trying to fill your book was, was huge. And yeah, I never managed to fill my book. <laughs> one show. I had a good go. At, at least I tried. Panini were quite quick to think on their feet and thinking, well, We've got the boys and the lads collecting these things, but what about the girls? I wasn't allowed to touch my brother's football stickers. That was a no-no. What have you done with my Kevin Keegan? What have you done with Maradona? I'm like, what are you talking about? Outside of football, most of the other things we did were very traditional. So we would have mammals or dinosaurs or birds. And then this new magazine came along and launched called Smash Hits. I was a massive Smash Hits fan. I would buy Smash Hits religiously every two weeks. I look at all the pictures, read all the lyrics, give you some info about their personal life or the name of the dog. And then every year, just before my birthday in April, they bring out the sticker album. We produced the first Smash Hits album. And it was enormous. Smash Hits was my all-time favourite magazine and I lived for it. So to get this one and do this one was so cool. We'd rip open these stickers. And you'd be like, wow, John Taylor, I really needed John Taylor. And you'd be like, Rick Astley, oh, got him. I have a strong memory of missing parts of Madonna's big face. I mean, I mean the one where you get nine, not that she has a big face. I'd take the stickers to school. Who do you like best, George Michael or Andrew Ridgely, which one? And then, and then you'd, like, kiss a few of the stickers. <laughs> a Simon Le Bon could be worse. A Blumange, a Bow Wow Wow, and half a Cocteau Twin. The volumes were incredible. It was tens of millions of packets. It was a constant fight to try to find collections that would enable you to maintain those volumes. We did uh, an Action Man sticker collection. Transformers. Back to the Future. My Little Pony. Care Bears was a huge success. And then, of course, famously, we eventually got round to thinking about the royal family. I didn't really feel, you know, that the Lord Chamberlain would probably even understand what this product category was. But to our surprise, he thought it was quite a nice idea, and he said, well, we should talk about that. The Panini brothers really held it in high esteem. They were actually doing a collection for the royal family. We had described a coach incorrectly, and we were told that this change, albeit very late in the process, would be very important. I remember saying, why is that? The Queen noticed this error and she has requested that it be changed <laughs> of course <laughs> so she was proofreading the album and i can remember the royal family well who's going to buy this you know kids are not going to buy this wh smith they decided to run little swap shops for the royal family sticker album in their stores and i was incredibly surprised to see the queue to swap stickers were in fact nearly all old age pensioners and they had queues around the block and and they were all mature ladies wanting princess anne and prince charles stickers it was quite <laughs> In 1986, very important year. And what we have here, one of my favourite ones, is the Mexico 86 World Cup album. Let it go! And the Gretchen again! Magnificent goal! We're gonna beat the world so here! He's 
the 86 was Panini at the very, very best. Quality, second to none. They were selling millions of packets of stickers in the UK and worldwide, and any sort of successful company like that is, is, is bound to sort of draw the vultures around to have a piece of the action. Back in the mid-1980s, the Daily Mirror and the, and the Sun dominated the daily news agenda. Readership that was probably, you know, hovering around 20 million. So that's just absolutely uh, enormous. You had the Maxwell Group with the Mirror, you had the Murdoch Group with the News International, and whatever one had, the other wanted. The two owners didn't like each other, didn't get on. It didn't matter what you were looking at, they would compete. So football stickers was just another area. It was the Mirror first who got the idea of doing a promotion with our stickers, and then that perked up the Sun's interest. So then we had News International come on to us to say, we have a million more readers than them. Why aren't you working with us? To have the opportunity to work with one or the other was both a fantastic opportunity, but it also came with inherent dangers. By becoming allied with one, you were making nasty enemy in the other. Penini family said, well, OK, Peter, you have to work this out. Tell us which of these two groups to work with. So we invited both the Daily Mirror and the Sun to come to our head office in Italy and effectively pitch for the sticker promotion business. So here we had the two biggest newspapers in the land fighting over working with Panini. It's quite amazing. The Daily Mirror did a very smooth, slick, uh, data-backed presentation. And then for The Sun, the editor came, Kelvin McKenzie. And he became abundantly clear that this guy wasn't going to go home without the Panini sticker promotional business. He got impatient, took his wallet out of his pocket, and said, you know what? He said, you might as well have that. You've got everything else. <laughs> we decided on the sun. But apparently Mr. Maxwell was more than a bit upset. I mean, he was absolutely livid. As far as Robert Maxwell was concerned, the mirror was his pride and joy. He would not let that come second to the sun if he possibly could avoid it. And I think that led to the decision that you can't beat him, buy him. Panini decided to sell due to losing one of the four brothers. The families probably thought it was best to cash in now, and uh, they sold it for close to 100 million pounds sterling. I went on holiday in the summer, and when I got back, the first thing they told me was that Maxwell's talking to the Panini family about buying the business. And uh, <clears throat> this wasn't regarded by us as good news. When his name came up as being the guy that was going to purchase the Panini company, um, and that was really more than we could cope with. I just found him rather pompous, and he had the reputation of being a bully and we knew that as soon as he bought the company, he would move new managers in above us. We loved the world that we were in at Panini. That world was going to be destroyed by just a major capitalist who wasn't really a fan of stickers or football or Care Bears. He just, it was just another money-making thing to him. And we really loved what we did, and we really wanted to carry on what we did. And that's when we started. Uh, thinking seriously about going out on our own. In January 88, Kelvin Gardner phoned me to say, Peter, I'd like to meet you in London for a quiet lunch. Uh, he said, I, I mean a quiet lunch, you know, away from the office. They approached me and said, this is what we're thinking of doing, would you join us? And I did without hesitation. After the Maxwell takeover, we have the seeds of uh, a rebellion. Panini was really all-powerful, all-dominant in the business, so there was no other, no competitor really to move to. So if we were going to carry on with what we liked doing, we had to form our own company to do it. It was really very scary for us as individuals because we did all mortgage our homes. So we had 750k to start with, so in other words, we'd risked everything. We probably were mad. Um, we didn't think we were. I had no hesitation and no doubt that we could make it work. It's what happened after and when we got started that 
gave us sleepless nights. The new managers had gathered everybody together in the boardroom and they'd said, right, these people are starting a new company, but I'm here to tell you that we're going to blow them out of the water by Christmas. Card collecting has come a pretty long way from being used to promote chewing gum. It's now big business in its own right. And an Italian company, Panini, are the leaders in the field. At the end of the 80s, Panini was now owned by Robert Maxwell. And Panini were the kings of stickers. Wide here for Muren, played a lovely early ball in towards Van Basten. Oh! What a glorious strike by Van Basten. Oh, Thomas, it's up for grabs now! Thomas! Right at the end! But me and three other rebels had formed a rival company by then and were plotting to take its crown. When we set out to start this new business, we knew we'd need a name. I could probably claim it probably did come from me because we have got a bit of an Arthurian legend obsession in the house. Our house is called Pendragon. So maybe I was the one that sheltered it. In the end, that was the one that stuck. When we set the business up, we, we, we got to chose a car. I decided I'd have a Sierra GT, and I thought I was pucker. And then Pete announced that we were all going to have car phones, and that was it, we arrived. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, dance, dance. We wanted to do a football album, and we called it Team 90, and we had everything riding on that. We were a fledgling company, We'd all remortgaged our houses to try and start the business. That's a very precarious situation in which to potentially come up against the giant of the, the UK business community. Yeah, I mean, I certainly remember when Merlin was set up. Yeah, you know, you're concerned, you look at what you do, you look at how to make sure that your product is, is superior to their product, and you certainly defend your rights. Within days of us announcing our first publication. Calvin and I woke up one morning and the Ritz had dropped onto our doormats. Maxwell concocted a story that we'd been plotting this several years in advance and had been working internally to damage Panini sales. And then I received one, and so I was accused of aiding and abetting. So the three of us ended up with these Ritz. But the thing that was most damaging wasn't the lawsuit, but the leverage that um, was applied to parts of the trade. The first launch had gone out. We are in the flower shop selecting the flowers for our wives for that evening and uh, uh, come, coming running up to this flower shop in Milton Keynes is Mark Hillier. I went running into the shopping centre to try and find him and said to Peter, we've got a real problem here. He said, we've got wholesalers phoning and cancelling their orders. I said, what? Why? Peter Walsh, that a message to call you desperately today. The order that we have in, please don't deliver it. We don't need it. We don't need it? It was really serious. It was more way over half of our business. I knew that there was a battle on, and I was trying to piece together, uh, you know, what might have been going on in the background. Maxwell Communications threatened the distributors of the Daily Mirror that if they continued to cooperate with this, uh, this, uh, this evil empire, Merlin, that they'd have little alternative but to take away the distribution of the Daily Mirror. 
I mean, what they've said is because of the Brits and because of the pressure on the distributor, your father was actively trying to force them out of business. That wouldn't surprise me. In our first six months of trading, we lost £500,000, which was virtually all the capital that we had, essentially. That, that, that's, that's how bad things got. Our whole business, our, our whole livelihood was on the line, and so the pressure mounted on everybody. Mark Hillier phoned me to say, Pete, he said, I know you've got a lot on your mind, but I wanted to remind you that I'm due on holiday. I'm going to America at the weekend. I mean, what, what should I do? I mean, should I go or, or should I cancel? Uh, and I said to him, I said, Mark, um, you go. I mean, I mean, frankly, I mean, there's nothing you can do that's going to make any difference at this moment. I, I said that with, you know, tears in my eyes. You know, whether we'll have a business when you get back or not, I can't promise you. I can remember going home to my wife and my kids were really young and saying, well, you know, I think by the end of this week, we're probably going to lose everything. And uh, so, yeah, it was pretty scary. He was really going for us, hook, line and sinker. He really was. And he'd have had um, the house, everything. For me, this is a red rag to a bull. I, I will hang in there tooth, nail and claw, and I really began to dislike Robert Maxwell <laughs> to such an extent that I just kept saying to Kelvin, go for it, whatever it takes. The last roll of the dice actually was the WWF collection, the World Wrestling Federation it was then. Well, to be honest with you, WWF, nobody had heard of it. Hulk Hogan, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Who the hell is Hacksaw Jim Duggan? Are you mad? Everybody who we talked to said wrestling, that died with Kent Walton and Kendo Nagasaki and Big Daddy. That's ancient history. What we discovered was that uh, World Wrestling Federation was incredibly popular with kids. I saw Hulk Hogan uh, became mesmerized by the size and the sheer strength and power of this guy. Um, and I just became obsessed from wrestling. As a child, I thought it was real. Back then, you could do a pile driver, drop someone on the head, and it looks fantastic. We were of that age where we were probably watching a lot of cartoons, so these were real cartoons. The only way you could find out about a lot of these things was through word of mouth. It was on Sky TV. Very few people had a Sky uh, TV box in their home, very few people. So I'd picked out that my eldest, he, he was videoing it and taking the video to school so, so the other kids could see it. I used to record all the wrestling shows on a weekly basis. And then I, what I did was I made a little subscription business at school. I, I would charge a standalone fee of five pounds for the pay-per-view. And it got to the stage where I, I was coming home with so much money, my dad said, where are you getting all this money from? And I explained to him what I was doing, and he was, he was actually quite impressed. I knew the guy that owned the rights. And so we, we chatted and I, I said, I'll buy them. He was, he was shocked, frankly, because nobody was buying rights for the WWF. They helped us tremendously by making a TV commercial for us. Put him in his place, Macho King! Put him in his place! Oh, yeah! The WWF Superstar Sticker Collection has hundreds of color stickers and this super album. It may be the only way the Macho King could stick it to the Ultimate Warrior. Dig it! WWF Superstar Stickers at your news agent now! As we got closer and closer to the launch, I can't tell you the excitement that was building. It was just incredible. It was launched on a Thursday, and on a Friday, we were checking retail sale. This is when the car phones come in really handy. The first person to phone me was Peter Dunk. So the news agent was empty, just the lady behind the counter. And as soon as she realised I was from the company that produced these stickers, she said, oh, have you got any stock in your car? The rest of the team were all phoning in with the same sort of response. I've just been into a news agent and they got the stock yesterday and it's sold out. A whole box has gone, under packets. It's incredible. And we, we knew immediately that we got something really special, really special. I mean, it, it, it was staggering. 
but this is phenomenal. Hulk Hogan obviously being number one, that was the one that we'd always try to try to get, and I, I remember that being the hardest one. And what we'd also done with this sticker album was offer for sale on the back page some other World Wrestling Federation merchandise, and you couldn't really get this stuff in the UK at the time. Postman arrived with sacks of mail this, this high, full of letters. He said, what on earth are you people doing here? I said, well, we're... He said, I've got a van load of this stuff. He said, I've got about 20 or 30 sacks in the van. The volume of orders, it worried us because we didn't know whether we'd be able to cope with it. All the family members, any, anybody we could, we could drag off the streets were coming in packing jiffy bags with T-shirts and videos well into the night. And on that first day, we took, I think it was £80,000 in mail order sales. And actually, I think it was that cash that got us through the really difficult period. I think, I think without that, we, 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 we probably would have not survived. And so the World Wrestling Federation rescued us from that short-term cash flow problem. It was a huge success for us anyway. And by the time we'd finished with that, we would enter the year that Robert Maxwell actually died and the whole thing collapsed with him, of course. I was in the office, actually. I think we were all in the office. And uh, Peter Dunk, I think, rushed into the office, threw the doors open and said, have you heard the news? I thought, well, we well, know what, what's happened. He said, Robert Maxwell is lost at sea. I said, what does that mean? He said, he's fallen off his boat. He's drowned. We think he's drowned. And it wasn't long after that, of course, that um, the Mirror Group pension scandal came to light. When my father died, the business uh, imploded, and all of the operating businesses, of which Panini was one, were sold. UK releases, the quality uh, deteriorated quite quickly. Um, something was, was wrong. Football sticker sales were at an all-time low. They were down into, you know, we talk about tens of millions of packets. Football was down below that level at that time, in single digits. And we wondered really what was going to happen next to the football sticker. Um, was it maybe the end of the football sticker? Title goes to Manchester United. I think it was 1992 when the Premier League was formed, rocking the world of British football to its foundations. So winning the rights to the Premier League would clearly establish either ourselves or Panini as Britain's number one sticker seller. They were the competitor, all right, in everything we did. I mean, whether it be an entertainment collection, they would be bidding for the rights, we would be bidding for the rights. And thankfully, during this period I'm talking, we won most of them. I've forgotten we'd done a lot of these Robocop, Stargate, Desert Storm. That was when they invaded Kuwait, I think. We did, why did we do an album on that? The Premier League was newly formed. We'd always wanted to get back into football officially. And so we saw this as an opportunity. We got in touch with Rick Parry, who was the chief executive of FA Premier League, and went to do our first pitch to him. It was really exciting. We had some amazing brainstorming sessions about what the product would look like and what we could do and how we would market it. Our story was really the story of how football stickers have succeeded over the last 10 years and who was it who did that. It's the four guys sitting in front of you. And we'd also say, look what happened since we stopped doing that. The market is in a terrible mess. Allow us to put it right and re-establish football as the biggest selling sticker collection in the UK. In the house I lived at, at the time, we had a telephone right by the television set. And I was standing by the television set when the phone rang. It was Rick Parry ringing to say that the Premier League clubs had decided they were going to go with Merlin Publishing. What a fantastic day that was. That uh, The jewel, the absolute jewel in the collectibles business, whew, 
fantastic. Football stickers were alive again. Made the front page. <laughs> it's a bit surreal because I was only, yeah, what would I have been then? 19. And it's gone from collecting the, the stickers to actually being being one of them stickers. It was a weird feeling. It was a weird feeling, to be honest. But a good feeling. Merlin got the right players, the right kits, the right season, and that, that was all collectors ever wanted. And it, it all came together, and, uh, and they, they never looked back from there. Nothing to having the Premier League deal in, in 94, in just four short years, was nothing short of miraculous. Selling millions and millions of packets or something, Makes you feel pretty good and proud, actually. I was really proud of it. A lot of kids and adults, uh, but mainly kids, got a lot of enjoyment out of those collections. Welcome to the Soccer Stock Exchange. Since January, the publishers have sold 77 million packets of Premier League players, and now the pressure's on to complete the collections. I helped set out the first swap shop and had no idea how big they were going to be. I said, right, OK, we'll open the doors now, Leslie, and let the people in, not knowing how many people are outside, and there was 15,000 people outside. <laughs> it was chaos. Actually, it was quite frightening. We literally gridlocked town centres. There wasn't enough car parking. No, then who else we got? We did one at Norwich City Football Club. He said, we don't get this many people on a match day. This is fantastic. <laughs> Thousands of kids, and they're bringing swaps to us today, all with the purpose of completing our album. We had staff guarding the stickers with our lives so they didn't all get stolen. I remember turning up, and um, you'd hear on the radio that the motorways were, were blocked and uh, massive delays because all of these kids are just going to one place just to get the stickers that they needed or meet meet one of their heroes, so it was it was huge. I've got half the Forest team here and I want to swap it for just one David Beckham. Now that's a good deal, isn't it? What do you think? No. Why not? Because they're rubbish. Parents got involved as much as the children trying to finish the albums. I'm happy dad that I don't have to buy them anymore. It was really exciting, just the pleasure of seeing the kids, you know, finish their albums. Yes! In the five years between uh, 89 and 94, Merling was recorded as being the fastest growing company in the UK. We had an approach from Tops, who were obviously very well known in the States, principally for their baseball cards, which was sort of legendary. We like you guys, we like what you do, we like the style. Can we buy the business? It was a lot of money, a lot of money. <laughs> $50 million. Yeah, I was a kid from a council estate, you know. I didn't have any, anything like that kind of money. So in the summer of uh, 1995, uh, we sold the business for $50 million to the Tops Company, Inc. They obviously went to Vegas, <laughs> which I had quite forgotten about. Viva Las Vegas! Viva! Viva! I think we should be grateful for Merlin for what they did in the mid-90s, because I think without Merlin there, I don't think we'd have the stickers now. They dominated, and Panini fell away. Well, Panini eventually emerged from their turmoil when they appointed a chief executive, a guy called Aldo Salustro. From that time, Onwards, really, things changed. Panini, I think, had done well to keep hold of the World Cup licence. Still ones that everybody sort of looked forward to collecting. Since that 1970 album, each and every one has outsold the one before. If you can sort of date the start of this whole craze back to the mid-70s. The people who were youngsters then are now in their 40s and 50s. We've got disposable income. 
still got that dog inside to collect. In the old days, it was two packets if you were lucky. Now you could buy a whole box. What Panini sensed was that there were adults buying this thing as well as, as children. We were talking about the World Cup in 2014. Um, that was the cherry on the cake. It was like a, do you know what? I wouldn't mind collecting those again. And off we all go again. Tens of millions of packets. You're talking about a lot of stickers. It's massive in Brazil, it's massive in Africa, it's, it's massive in America. It's, it's hundreds of millions, hundreds if not billions. I think there's just something about even in this digital age where you've got everything on your phone and iPad, it's still nice just to handle something. There's something very basic and simple about a sticker and it's glossy <laughs> and it sticks. The nostalgia, the generational thing, the fact that stickers are seen as a fun pastime that's traditional, I think it, it's going to be a hobby that's going to be with us forever. You just open that packet, you don't know what's in there. I wonder if it's the one that I really, really want. There's something magical about it. It's brilliant. Shake an apple off an apple tree Shake a shake a sugar But you'll never shake me uh -uh -uh. No sir I'm gonna stick like glue Stick because I'm stuck on you